Hi, my name is Stuart Lynch, and in this video, I want to show you what tuples are all about in Swift and provide you with some practical examples that you might consider using in your existing or future projects. I love getting your feedback, so tap the thumbs up button if you enjoyed this video and leave a comment below. Make sure you subscribe to the video and ring that bell to get notifications of new videos. And if you want to support my work, you can buy me a coffee. I've created a sample Xcode playground for this tutorial and I recommend that you download it from the link in the description and work along with me. That way, in the future, you'll have a completed playground and code that you can refer to. If you open the playground, you can access the sidebar by tapping on this button here. And there are a couple of files in the source folder for the entire playground that are used by the different pages. The playground functions file is simply a function with a closure that will allow us to keep our code examples organized and separated, as you'll see. The wine model contains a struct with a wine with three properties for variety, winery, and vintage, along with a static array called wines with some sample wine. This will be used in the last example. If you're not seeing this rendered markup in the introduction, but rather seeing the raw markup like this, you can switch to Rendered Markup by selecting that option from the Editor menu. So let's get started with the basics. So what is a tuple? Well, a tuple is a compound data type that works very similarly to a struct, but tuples can be created and used on the fly. So let's take a look at an example declaration of a tuple. This is great for creating one-off type scenarios where creating an equivalent struct would be excessive. I'm going to show you some examples shortly. In this first example, you're asked to create a tuple that will contain a country name, its population, and the number of states or provinces that it has. We can create a tuple called country, and to create a tuple, you simply start with your parentheses, and then within the parentheses, provide values corresponding to the properties you wish to represent, separated by commas. And those values can be different types. For example, we can let Canada be equal to a tuple containing three elements. Canada as a string, so surrounding quotes, 37 million, which is the population, and 10 representing the number of provinces or states that we have in Canada. Each of those properties can be accessed using an ordinal value starting at zero. So if we want to print them, we can use country.0 to represent the name, one to represent the population, the second item in the tuple, and two will be the number of states, the third item. If I run the playground, the results are printed to the console. Let me bring it in from the edge a bit just so we can see it easier. In the second example, we want to use the same tuple, but make it a bit easier to access the values rather than using a zero, a one, or a two. So what we can do is assign names to our values like this, where we create a tuple, and then we create the names in a tuple itself, and assign our country to that name tuple. This one has the same effect as saying, let name equals country.0, let population equals country.1, and let states equal country.2. So printing out the values can be done using those names. Well, I seldom, if ever, use that method I just showed you. Instead, I combine those two things by creating a name for each value on creation of the tuple, just like I do kind of with structs. I'll start with the same creation as before, but now I'm going to assign names for each of those values in the tuple, like this. That combines the two steps in the previous example. But when we print out each property, we'll need to specify that it is a property of this country. So we'll use dot notation and specify the instance name of the country with that property name. So let's move on to the next page and we can use the navigation links to get to that page. I've created a sample function that I'm going to be using in example one that currently does not use a tuple. 
And then I have a country's dictionary that we'll use for examples two, three, and four. So I'll come back to this. In the first example, I want to replace those three parameters in the function with a single one that's going to be a tuple. So I'll create that function, and I'm going to give it the same name, and I can do that within this code block, country info, and it'll have a single parameter that I'm going to name country, but I'm going to use an underscore so that I don't have to specify that label at the call site when I'm calling this function. The tuple then will be the same three parameters that we had in our example. If I want to print the same statement then, we need to specify our label name for each of the tuple properties. So I can use a control shift click to create multiple cursors in front of each of those values, and then just simply type country dot. When I call the function then, I just have to provide a named tuple with the actual values. So Canada for the name, the population being 37 million, and the states being 10. In example two, we're asked to return tuple. Now you may not have realized this, but you likely have seen tuples returned from a function before. If I open the developer documentation and go to the definition of the URL session, like I see here, I can scroll down to where the functions are. And if I stop at the asynchronous functions, I see that in each case, we have a tuple returned, the data and the URL response. If I scroll down further, you'll see that the completion handler versions use a tuple with optional data, optional URL response, and an optional error for the completion handler. That's a tuple. This second example here then wants us to provide a string representing a country name and then use it as the key to return both the name and the population in return. So we'll create that function. For the parameter then, I'll use an underscore and then the label of name, which is a string. And then I'm going to return a tuple. And that tuple will be my name, string, and population, which is an int. So for the name, it will be the same name that we provide. But for the population, I'm going to return the country dictionary value at that name key. Well, the issue is that we may not have a value for the key we entered. So this population integer here must be an optional to handle that case. Now we can print the results of calling the country info function, passing in the string Canada. Let's try to print out the country info for Ukraine. When I run this, I see that we do get Canada's population as an optional value. And Ukraine, however, is nil. Our dictionary doesn't have Ukraine as a key. Well, we can make our code more readable using a type alias. A type alias in Swift is a way to define an alternate name for an existing data type. And it provides a way to refer to the type using a different name, which can make code easier to read and maintain. So for example, we can create a type alias, and I'll call it country data. And it's going to be a tuple that has two named values, name, which is going to be a string, and population, which will be an optional int. So we can copy the function from our previous example then, and simply replace the returned tuple with that type alias. Then we can do the same as before to print the country info, providing Canada as the key. Let's create a constant for US, that is the country info for the string United States. When we print us.population, it is an optional, but we can use nil coalescing to provide an alternate string.
like unknown. Now my value is unwrapped. Well, let me copy and change US to UK, which stands for Ukraine, and pass Ukraine in as the string to our function. When I run this time, because there is no value in the dictionary for the key Ukraine, the population is unknown, and that's what's printed. One other useful technique is to use tuples to convert a dictionary into an array of tuples where the first value is the key and the second is the value of that dictionary's key. So we can use a map function to do this. Where we can use the $0 to represent the key and $1 the value. Now. I can loop through my country array that I've created using a for in loop and then print the country name, for example. Well, these aren't sorted, but since country array is an array, we can simply sort by comparing each of the keys using the name property of the tuple. Now the array is sorted. For our last example, I want to go over a quick example of a use of tuples that I created an entire video on with respect to sorting an array of objects with multiple properties. I've showed you this file already and it's the struct for wine that has those three properties along with a static array of wines formed by creating instances of the wine object. If I return to my example again, let me let all wines be equal to that static array. If I loop through this array, I can use a for in loop to print out those three properties on a single line using commas to separate them. There's no specific sort order though. What I want to do is to sort first on variety, then within varieties, sort by winery. And then if a winery has more than one vintage for that variety, sort by year, all of them ascending. So we can create another array then that I'm going to call sorted wines and apply a sort method on all wines. For our comparison, we can provide two tuples with a less than in between so that we can compare the properties. And it's easy. We simply use $0 to represent the values in the order of our sorting, such as I described. So variety, then winery, and then vintage. On the right hand side then, we simply use the same tuple organization, but use $1 to represent the next instance for the sort. So let me create another loop for this array for the comparison. And also let me add some dashes in between so that we can actually see the difference. Well, let me run now. And there you have it. I can clearly see that my wines are sorted by variety first, from Chablis down to Shiraz. And then if we have more than one winery with that variety, the wineries are sorted alphabetically, like we have for our Chardonnays from 50th parallel down to Sumac Ridge. And then if one of the wineries has more than one vintage for that particular variety, as Lindemann's does, then they're ordered by year. The video I have prepared on this topic goes much more into detail, including how to sort ascending on some and descending on other properties. So I hope you've learned something in this short video that you can use in your own projects in the future. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and leave a comment. Be sure to subscribe to my channel to get notified of future videos. Thanks for watching.